All right, good evening. Can you all hear me? I'm a little bit losing my voice, sorry. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> welcome back from spring break. I hope you guys had a good break. Um, it's, I'm going to introduce tonight's guest lecturers, um, and so it's a pleasure for me to welcome tonight uh, Pio Venefabe to GSAP, and it's their first time lecturing at the school, and the first time also lecturing in New York and the U.S., so it's, I'm very thrilled to be able to present them tonight and participate in our discussion at the end. Um, so uh, Pio Venefabe uh, was founded in 2013 in Milan, and is currently uh, there working between Milan and Brussels. Um, and it's led by Ambra Fabi and Giovanni Piovene. Um, it's an architectural office that works in national and international contexts and is active in the field of architecture, urban research, sorry, urban research, territorial visions, and design. The office activity develops through commissions, competitions, publications, workshops, and teaching. Um, I think in the context of us being in our school, uh, environment. I think many of the themes that they're working on in their office resonate well with uh, the core curriculum in the MARC uh, program as well as in the advanced studios. So I'm very excited tonight to see them present the work um, through, their, through their lecture and images. Um, I think it's also important to note that they both teach um, and have taught for some time um, and are currently teaching at the École d'Architecture et de la Ville et des Territories à Marne-la-Vallée um, in France. Um, Ambra Fabi graduated from architecture in Medrizo. She has also worked as art director and project leader at the office of Peter Zumthor and Partners. Giovanni Piovene studied um, at the Universita IUAV in Venice um, and also in um, France. Uh, and is the co-founder and editor of the architecture magazine San Rococo. And I was very happy today to have them in my seminar, so thank you for coming and presenting the work, both of the books um, as well as the exhibition um, at the AA. So it's um, just been a, a delight for me. I have been following their work for a few years, and so um, from seeing the, the kind of wonderful um, exhibition of the San Rococo um, Book of Copies as it was installed um, in the installation at the AA, a kind of very beautiful black uh, yet playful uh, framework uh, book stand for the copies to um, seeing their work in Fabrizio Galante's The World in Our Eyes. Uh, more recently, something I'm looking forward to hearing them speak about is more a prefab housing typology. Um, and then in November, uh, seeing at the Chicago Biennial their installation uh, looking at the Milan uh, subway uh, through a kind of invention of new furniture, uh, beautifully, richly, um, just exquisite pieces that were uh, among my favorite things that I saw there, um, and some of the things that stuck with me the most from the entire show. I have to say I really enjoyed seeing the work. Um, they make things look playful, yet elegant, sophisticated, and all done with, I think, a very palpable, refined sense of a concern for making things real. So um, I think it's exciting and stimulating um, and I think makes a very careful claim and stakes position on what is of value today, not only in architecture, but across all design things uh, from environments to furnitures and to cities. Um, in addition, I think what's important to note about what they're doing, not only in their office, but through teaching. They're part of a larger teaching group at their university, which will uh, co-curate the next Lisbon Architecture Triennial in 2019. So please welcome Pio Venefabe. So thank you very much, Hilary, for uh, uh, the nice words you had for our work of appreciation. And thank you very much to the Columbia GSAP uh, for having us here. I mean, for us, it's a great honor to present our work, I mean, the work of a pretty somehow small office in such a context, which is, uh, I mean, quite important for us. So um, this is the title of our uh, lecture today, half object, half architecture. And we start, uh, we'd like to start with this image, which is not 
made by us. I mean, uh, it's an image by Ettore Sotsas done in 1976 called, uh, I mean, which has a funny title, which is uh, not everybody can design their life as a feast. And uh, for us, I mean, as a starting point of our lecture, this image represents a possible definition of what architecture could be, at least for us, in this moment, uh, uh, what we are interested in today. And uh, if we look at the picture, I mean, it's uh, not uh, forcefully, I mean, architecture is not forcefully a roof. It's made uh, here of four poles which uh, uh, um, define a field, so a perimeter. So this flags as a sort of necessary ornament of architecture. And finally, the bread and the wine on the, on the lower part of the image, which is somehow the life which animates architecture. So regardless the scales of the project we're going to show you tonight, we think that we can find almost in every project this series of uh, principles, characteristics. So maybe we start then with the first project. Uh, which is a project about a temporary architecture for a festival. So, okay. Um, it was a project which was built, no, maybe let's start first with that. Um, it's a temporary pavilion as a, in this uh, image of a canaletto. Um, here, for instance, you see uh, an image in which uh, a temporary pavilion is done with very few elements, some poles, a roof. Um, this is the San Rocco um, festivity, which happens in uh, Venice. Here, the, these very few elements define an extension of the church, um, just with very few things. No. Here, this uh, image of um, Michael Bartemeli Olivier, it's an um, image of the, ninth, of the 18th century in which um, a prince, the, the Prince de Conti, make a party for another prince, Charles Guillaume Ferdinand. And uh, it's really uh, just a space for a temporary space for a, for a, for a feast, just a, a very simple element. So um, we got Somehow we got selected for uh, this um, festival, a festival organized in Brussels um, in the context, organized by an institution, um, um, a public in institution which um, take care of uh, parks and environment, which made uh, every two years a festival dedicated to the parks. So this is the edition of uh, 2016 in which uh, the curators um, organized the whole festival around the, the essential garden. This was the first proposal we did for the festival. The festi the, this site was the main pavilion of the festival, which was hosting at the same time a space for a scene, which is the square piece, um, a distillery, which was somehow the the core and also the landmark of the, of the festival, which was also the place where all the activities were uh, organized, and the cafe. And these three objects somehow separated, they were kept together by um, a perimeter. So gradually um, we got selected, also together with the, um, a collective from London, the decorators. We got selected um, and the the project had to reduce to its essence, to its minimal, because of budget reason. And at the end, that's um, the, the result. Um, in a way, uh, a squared perimeter, which is at the same time the, the space, the, an outside space and the inside space, where the, all the activities can happen. And then surrounding it, three minimal objects, three furnitures which are um, spaces where you can almost not get in. And the, the decorators um, design pieces. Uh, as you can see here, these objects, they can open um, and they can uh, scatter around pieces of the furnitures, which then populate the space for different activities. 
the roof can open and close. Um, so in the night, that would become also the, the screen for the light to come. And um, um, yeah. So this is the distillation tower, which is a bit of an ambiguous object. It's um, on one side a, land, a landmark, which is visible from very far away. Um, so then the distillery, really like a chemical laboratory where everything around the festival happens. And then it's also the support for the lamp. Um, this object closes in the day night, in the, in the night, and it becomes totally white. And when it opens, it reveals the color. And the same is for the other objects. So then here you see the relationship with the, the essential garden that was created in front of the pavilion, which then was nourishing as a primary material the, the festival itself. So during the festival, really, a lot of things were happening, like um, essential plant courses about how to cultivate them, how to use them, how to distillate them. Um, the, the roof could open and close according to the weather condition. Kitchen courses and classes. Um, and uh, at the end, this pavilion was, in a way, a very small um, action in this park, but um, in a way the, the neighborhood dis discovered the, this, this place which was in a way always there, but because of that they, it took another life. So then now to go on uh, with that, this, this festival was very successful. The, institution was very happy, then they asked us to take this pavilion as a, as a prototype and to, to make five kiosks in five parks in Brussels. We were, of course, very happy, but the, the, prog the program was somehow very, a bit different. It was not anymore um, this festival with these cultural activities, but it was really a kiosk. And so we had to reduce it even more to the core of it. At the end, we created a family of uh, pavilions, which took the principles and also the construction of the previous one. Um, and the, these pavilions, so in a way the, the perimeter, the canopy, the kiosk. And then um, with a with few set of rules, we made the differences. So the, these rules are, the way the roof change um, dimension to adapt to the site, the orientation, of course, in the site, and then the color. So uh, the structure is um, always, the metal structure is always painted in one different color, and also the interior of the kiosk, and uh, the outside is uh, white, kind of white, exactly the same white of the fabric. So there are always just two colors. Here is the replacement in the, of the pavilion which was done for the festival. So you see it's much more simple. And, uh, but in a way, we, we were very happy about it because we could really um, yeah, arrive to the essence of it. So we reduced, reduced, reduced until the moment uh, everything which was necessary stayed. So the yellow one was inscribing in a more urban environment and a much more popular one. So it was also interesting to see how the different um, pavilions were used from different people and in different moments of the day. This one, for instance, was always used for lunch. This one very much for the evening. Um, so in a way, um, the, yeah, to go more in detail into that, the elements are just this roof with this uh, perimeter. The roof is this white fabric, very simple, just to protect from the rain. It has few features in the sense that as a white um, element, it 
looks really like a cutout. So it really cut out the the landscape from the from the from the inside. It really becomes like a view. And at the same time, while being a fabric, it's re very much alive. So it's re it really um, reacts to the weather conditions, which is also very nice. And then there is the kiosk. The kiosk is a, a reinterpretation of the former one in a way that had to become more, uh, for obvious reason, um, more uh, uh, stable because it has to be dismantled and dismantled every year, but also to be built and uh, uh, in very little time. So it's really done with these panels, which are just attached to a very thin metal structure, and these panels are framed with a metal frame, which then define the drawing of the of the pavilion. When it's closed, it looks all the same, and then. As you see here, the pavilion open on one side, and the, the, the bar comes out. So you see it here in the blue pavilion. Um, it really changed a lot, the fact that there is this uh, intense color on one side, it really gives something else, which it, it really makes the difference on, from the, when it opened to when it closed. And inside every single object, yeah, even the sausage, is, are colored in, a, in the same color. Here you see also these both details. The roof was really manually done, very much low tech, so that uh, to open it and close it, you would need f few people on one side and few on the other. And these cables would be the, the way to, to move it. So the, the back of the pavilion, but here you see also, so there is the roof, there is the canopy, the kiosk, and then there are a few little features, objects which populate the space. Here, um, the lamp as a landscape, which substitute, as a landmark, which substitute the, the, um, the tower of the previous uh, f festival pavilion. And then, the tables, chairs, other lamps, a mo movable lamp which can be used for other for other sort of activities, which is also in a strange way the same color of the fabric and also makes this strange feeling of cut out of the landscape. Yes. So we show here another project, so which is the project uh, with uh, which. Hillary was uh, um, talking about before. So a project we, has been, uh, uh, we have been, uh, somehow, we have been chosen in this, for this uh, Chicago Biennial 2017, which uh, was curated by Mark Lee and Sharon Johnston, where we, whose title is, uh, was uh, Make New History. So somehow this is a project we had in mind since a bit. We neither, never had the occasion to develop it, and we found it uh, uh, perfectly fitting the theme uh, of, uh, of the biennial. So, and I, maybe we can discuss afterwards also why. So our project starts, sorry, yeah, I have to, starts from this. So this is the map of the first line of the metro in Milano, so the subway in Milano which opened in 1964, it's the first, it's the first uh, subway which opens in Italy, and which opens in the most metropolitan city in Italy. Of course, we are not comparing it with other metropolitan cities, we know well. But at the time, Milano was extremely metropolitan and was ready to accept this project. So this is uh, some, uh, an image of the project, and the project has been uh, assigned by the municipality to the Albini Helg office, office, which worked together with a Dutch designer, a Dutch graphic designer, which is called uh, uh, Bob Nord. So the project, and we, maybe we can see it better here, 
is uh, the project of, uh, let's say, is almost, uh, we could say, in uh, today, in, which, in a moment in which we like to divide uh, disciplines, a project of interiors. Because the architecture of the, of the infrastructure, let's say, was already existing. So it was uh, an infrastructure which was ready to be dressed with the project uh, of, uh, which could carry all the information of the metro. So you, in this image is quite clear, no? because you see the, all the infrastructural part, and you see that the uh, Albini intervention is just this blue dress with this green line on top. And the green line is the carrier of information. This uh, project had, had uh, a big success, the project of the Milano Metro, because Bob Norda, as a designer, was then asked to design the Metro of San Paolo in Brazil. And you can see that despite uh, more Brazilian colors and patterns, the project is quite similar. And to add another little uh, step to this, Bob Norda, together with Massimo Vignelli, founded the uh, Unimark International Office. And the reason uh, why um, then Unimark office was uh, asked by the MTA to design the metro map of uh, New York uh, was because of this uh, Bob Norda uh, work. So if you look at it carefully, you see many assonance among this project, so the project of the metro you take every day, and, and the metro, uh, the, the initial metro of Milano. So for us, that project, the Milano one, is extremely important. And uh, so to give you a little bit uh, more context uh, very fast, this, this moment in, uh, in Milano, this moment in Italy, was extremely uh, rich uh, for architects because companies like, uh, for example, this company Olivetti were asking designers, which are mainly, they were all architects because we're talking about Vignelli, he was architect, Sotsas was at an architectural education. All of them were architects because it was, it, it came indeed before a, a separation of careers, which are, we are really fun today. Of, um, so, Company like this were uh, really working with the designer to develop products like this one in 68, the Valentina product, but also um, projects like this, which are really office furniture. And this is uh, again uh, Sotsas for Olivetti, which develops office furniture and, uh, and adding uh, just a little bit, little twist to the project, make of this project a sort of a totemic piece, a kind of a small architecture, like in the way he folds the the, um, how you call them, cassette, the, um, I don't get, the, I don't remember the name, but the way he folds the, the metal plate and uh, in the way he also added this small uh, decoration, functional decoration of these small triangular holes. This moment, uh, in this moment, designer were called uh, to experiment new materials, like, uh, for example, this, uh, um, rubber floor which was, were, were, was used for the first time in, in the Metropolitana called the Pirelli floor that we have everywhere now, or this uh, stained concrete which is a, a particular um, concrete, I mean it's a patented concrete which is produced, we found out also, or is still produced now. This is the Pirelli floor I was mentioning before. So to come to our project, uh, we decided somehow to take this project as a reference and to condense this project into some furniture objects. So to transform this project using the material of the project. We first did a, sur a photographic survey with uh, an Italian photographer called Giovanna Silva and we took uh, a day of trip uh, around the Metropolitano of Milano taking pictures, kind of illegal pictures because as you know, it's not so easy to take pictures in, a, in the Metropolitana. And then we, we selected a series of uh, materials we were interested in, and we started to track back the companies which were producing them. So for, uh, we had uh, big success for some of them, which is very important. Maybe this made 80% of the, of the project, like the concrete one. 
and uh, a bit less, of course, for other materials. But for example, this is the concrete company. And with them, I mean, they restarted doing this kind of concrete a couple of years ago. And with them, we start experimenting again um, how to do large scale, uh, large, large scale. For them, is, this is large scale. So it's uh, uh, one uh, meter 50 diameter almost. But for them, this is, <laughs> this is large scale in the sense that they were, they, are, they were used before to do little tiles. So they, they tried this for us. And we were trying to test possibilities to compose them and into an object, like in this case, uh, a, a table, like a living room table. And then we selected a series of other material, again, this thing concrete, like uh, uh, this other station to make a smaller table, or this other thing concrete to make a, another smaller table or a stool, okay, in this case. We were also interested in the evolution of the Albini project uh, for the line number two of the Metropolitana that opened uh, uh, later, in which all this concrete paneling was then replaced by more economical uh, uh, metal paneling, which is this yellow one, the yellow one you see here. But the principle of the project is exactly the same. And so we tried also there to understand, because despite the, economy, the, the fact that this, is an, uh, this was more an economical uh, um, material, Anyhow, it contains a series of features like the texture, the color, and, uh, and, um, and this uh, uh, reinforcing uh, uh, folding, molding of the, of the plate. So out of that, I mean, out of that metal plate, we did, uh, we did a project of a paravent, uh, a paravent okay, which uh, in English is actually folding screen. Um, we found another one which we liked very much, uh, and we were interested in, which is used only in one station because of historical reasons, which is this blue uh, embossed, again, uh, metal panel again. And out of that, we made uh, the project of a small cabinet. And then to, f to finish the uh, signature railing of the Metro of Milano, which is like kind of really the signature of the Albini Helg project, uh, which is this red line, which indeed is part of the first red line of the Metropolitana Milanese, which brings the, um, the user to the train almost, with, which always end with this special uh, curve. And out of that, we decided uh, to do a lamp, which is, and this is the, like the project of the lamp. These are the family, let's say, uh, this series of furniture which somehow condense uh, this urban project of Albini, Elg, and Norda into a sort of domestic environment. And this is the project in place in Chicago, how it was realized, and uh, together with a good company of uh, Point Supreme Totem on the back, which I think is not the case, that uh, there were uh, some assonance among the two. The, the lamp, together with the pictures of Giovanna Silva, the, the, um, the survey she did with us in the metro. The lamp, together with other ob objects, the fold screen, the table, and the cabinet. This, I mean, we are extremely happy about this uh, project, I mean, ourselves because uh, we, ha we are happy about the result, I mean, uh, which we finally saw only in Chicago. And we are happy because uh, we will present, uh, I mean, these objects will be realized again and distributed by the Maniera Gallery in, uh, in Brussels. So somehow the Biennale project found uh, a sort of uh, continuation afterwards. Uh, actually, to, to stay, to re uh, the, the reason also of this Maniera collaboration is actually came for another project, which is a project, uh, a much smaller project, which uh, uh, also almost in the same, uh, in the same, uh, with the same time, ma in the, with the same timing, made us work together. Because in the fall 2017, uh, the gallery was invited by uh, an Italian institution which is connected with the Torino Art Fair to be present. With, uh, um, with some designer they have to select, which in this case we are. Um, 
uh, and uh, uh, we were associated with a stone cutter for the Val di Susa, which is a valley north of Torino. So somehow this kind of blind date, we had to, we had to deal with this blind date and try to understand what to do. And uh, just to give you some insights, this is uh, the typical stone uh, of uh, Val Susa, and uh, it's not a particularly precious stone. I mean, it's the stone that you use to do uh, sidewalks, like the border of sidewalks, the border of the road, and of course in Val di Susa they, you, you use it to do everything, like the balconies and so on. So, but it's not a, pre a very precious stone, it's a, it's a sort of granite, it's a kind of granite, so a layered, uh, a layered stone, uh, not particularly bright. So this is how the stone comes to the, to the atelier of the stone cutter in big blocks. This is how they open it. So they, first of all, they have to break it manually, put in some wedges, uh, which expand and make uh, the, the, the stone break uh, in the weak point. And uh, this is the stone where it breaks. And actually what we were interested, because we, we, have, we spent some days there, where was the quality of this stone, specifically the quality of the stone in the, in the places, in the surfaces which were manually cut. And normally the surfaces which are manually cut are discarded by the stone cutter because it's not perfect one. Um, they just um, take it out, they, they, they sew the, the block, they just discard this part. Uh, the result is a more, is not, uh, this, this surface because of the break is uh, extremely bright. It contains a lot of metal and, uh, and uh, it shines under the sun. When you cut it, the stone doesn't shine anymore. So um, we were extremely interested. We had to work hard to convince the stone cutter to keep this, uh, uh, this surface. And uh, in order to make a set of objects, which uh, are li like, um, somehow a set of monolithic objects. We are very interested to work this block that you saw before, um, almost as a, a set of geological samples. The thing that you do with the, when you dig uh, the ground with the machine, and you take out this cylindrical uh, piece of uh, earth. So we were interested to take, this, uh, to take this block and to excavate it somehow but keeping the quality of the upper surface and uh, at the same time to excavate um, the legs. I will show you some picture. This, this is part of the, of, the, of the work. This is part, of, again, of the... And so the way in which this monolithic object touched the ground is also worked out of the same block, so it's excavated out. And this... this uh, set of uh, volumes somehow when put together they somehow twist into something else like we we like to think uh, at them as uh, almost micro mod models or, or <laughs> as somehow micro buildings you know? so when we do this project we think about how they could compose uh, an urban environment even in the small scale they are these images show a little bit the difference among the upper uh, surface, which is bright, and the surface of the sides, which is uh, cut with the saw, and shows all the layering of the stone. And this is the bottom of one of the, of the pieces. So here we are going to introduce this project, which is an ongoing project. Um, which we are going to present as a finished product by June, more or less. So here what we, have, we are showing is the, the first approach to the project, which was a competition that we won um, two years ago. So the, um, the project is, in a way, it's how to build a house as a product of industry, and it's a very strange question because 
it's a it's how to, the question is how to build a house for uh, which doesn't have still a context doesn't still have a place and uh, what to do with that so we really in a way it's it's a house in which to make it you have to focus on the on the inner qualities of it and uh, so the project is in a way um, um, research on uh, types and how these types they can um, evolve, they can uh, compress, expand, how they can adapt and what this type is and how, what are the inherent qualities of the, of the, the spaces we, we create. This is an um, image of a, a, a Durand, Les Précis uh, Les Sons d'Architecture and it's, yeah, it's just as a starting point. So, um, mainly, um, also to make a prefab house which doesn't have a client yet, it's um, also an open question because it doesn't have really qualities. It doesn't, you don't know what are the have to be the qualities of this space. It cannot be so specific because otherwise this house which has to be prepared to, for a X client, yeah, we don't know what are the, the questions behind that. So in a way, for us, what was important is, was to create a space which we, called, uh, which we call neutral space, a space which is big enough and uh, simple enough to host whatever. So it's a space which, in a way, can be transformed through time. Although if the house um, evolves, if someone else comes to live in it, uh, it, it can be a space that um, takes other functions and uh, it can also host the same functions at the same time. But so to do that, you need also to create spaces which are um, very defined and that also inform the, the neutral space uh, with the, 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 the basic uses of the house. And that this, um, these spaces we call the edges, so the borders or edges. And we imagine so this house to be the, the connection of two spaces, so a space which is very undefined and the spaces which are very compressed on the border of it, which are um, really um, specific, so which at the end could be kitchens, bathrooms, but also beds. So this is the, the, the first typologies we had done. It was uh, um, two big spaces and then in between, and, and these spaces were always framed by these other smaller spaces. Um, on the roof, uh, another space, of course, the bedroom. Um, so it's just this um, uh, one floor plus roof. But this, uh, which you see on the left, uh, could be also could also become a two floors. So the the same room, the same um, typology, which has the peculiarity to be facing two sides, could be one or two floors, with or without roof. It opens possibilities. On the on the right, you see these low, small uh, buildings. It, it even could suggest that. Um, it could become a, a, a bar, a, a building, made out, made out of this uh, um, uh, typological um, apartments. So this is the expanded version of it. So instead of two uh, neutral spaces, we have many more, smaller, bigger. Uh, very lux on the low, on the lower part, a very I don't know. A luxurious house with a gigantic space and the smaller spaces on the side or a symmetric one. So it's just investigation on what this um, idea could bring to. This is uh, the cross uh, type. So it's a, it's a space, a big space which is organized on a cross and um, it should be on one floor, two floors, created a tower, create a bar. 
And then uh, the monodirectional one, which would, I don't know, uh, be possible to build towards the wall or with a very main view. And this could also evolve in the same way. So it would have um, these edges on the back and uh, defining the sp and uh, div divided the main spaces. And uh, this could also become, uh, if you think about it, uh, putting them together, this could al also become uh, housing on a slope or, a, or a almost like a um, nap. a fabric of, uh, of buildings. And uh, so here you see the uh, one of the main space of the of the of the yeah, some of the simplest um, uh, type the the living room kitchen slash office uh, the kitchen is on the side on the on the, le on the right at the very end there is a stair but in a way you see that the space could host many activities and here is the bedroom where also the bed is not in the middle of the space but it, it's put inside these uh, uh, edges. And this is a project which is the first time we present it because it opened last week. So we, we also have very few pictures and also the, in a way it's still not, we cannot still uh, show it in uh, its full use. It was a commission from the Bazaar in Brussels um, in the occasion of uh, their exhibition on uh, Fernand Léger, which opened a few weeks ago. And they asked, uh, be, because of Léger and of their, his period uh, in which he painted mainly circuses, uh, to, to make a space in front of the bazaar um, for the, the circus activities, but in a way in a larger term. Uh, so cultural event related to circus, um, Real acrobacies and, and so on. Um, so, but the circus has always a weird feeling because it's um, a sp it's always, in a way, put at the edge of the cities in a forgotten land. There is always a somehow a sad, uh, sometimes a sad uh, atmosphere around that. But then, the ver this very thin skin. Uh, really uh, um, separate this uh, somehow sad and, and the leftover envir environment from this uh, magic world and the surreal world of the circus. So also, yeah, the project was about that, what to do in a context. Now if you go back to our context, which was not really done for uh, making a circus because it is in front of the bazaar, which, which you see on the right, which is a beautiful building from uh, Orta. But you see that the site is very narrow. On the left side, there is a building site. So in a way, yeah, it felt a bit like uh, this. Uh, there was a space, which was a space in between. And uh, at the same time, on a slope, at the same time, a place where uh, um, a landscape project would, will come in the next months. So a changing environment to which the temporary pavilion which we built and uh, which it, they asked that we could uh, take away and put back again would have to adapt. But so um, in a way in this very narrow plot we <laughs> the, the only solution possible was to make a half circus, which was um, fitting and giving this idea of uh, grandeur, but not really being so big and fitting to this narrow plot. And also because in this plan you can see the um, intervention which will come, the landscape intervention which will come in the next months. So even there it could fit in the leftover space of, the, of this landscape intervention. So it's a project which could, now at the, at the moment has been built in this way, but it, in the future can be built again in, um, in the next phase of the, of the plot. 
So this is the structure. In a way, it was also very complicated. It could we couldn't a circuit has always these uh, tension cables, but the site was done as such that it was not possible to to put tension cable to build with this kind of structure proper of the circuit. So the circ the project became a structure which lays on its own and which lays on a on a circle. A circle which to make the, the, the very sloping ground flat. And which also has a very, in a way, strong foundations out of concrete. And um, it's, yeah, now I talk about meters, but I don't know if, <laughs> if we, but okay, it's, um, it's 14 meters, seven meters radium. And, uh, and then there is this, uh, this uh, skin which completely cover it, um, done of the same fabric of the circuses. Um, so the question was how with the smallest intervention to create a pavilion which would have the, um, give the idea of a circus, which since the, the, the circus was not really possible to build there. So it was this uh, um, half circus as, and this slope of the roof. And um, the fabric would be, of course, done in, in stripes, very light stripes, and we'll explain later why. So beside these stripes, then there will be few objects which would uh, populate it, or also give it, um, express it more. So the entrance would be an enlightened entrance, the star would be uh, the, la the landmark to, to be, to say I'm here, and then some signals and so on. So these are the, the few pictures of the, of the last week after the opening. It's, um, yeah, in a way it's a, it's a very silent pavilion in a way in which the colors are so similar to the, to the city. So, at the first glance from outside, it's a very simple shape, a bit mute, and it doesn't really reveal so much um, what is inside. Um, then inside, it's a yeah, it's a half circular space, uh, which is uh, there to host these activities, and um, and this, which yeah, in a way, it's just a simple space, and uh, it's done with. with just very few elements which you see here, which are metal structure, fabric, cables, and uh, belts. But at the end, here we can find back this leger idea of having these um, spaces which don't, we do not completely grasp. So the idea of the half circle, the idea of this, this uh, this horizontal line, there are these, these lines that become the drawing of a Leger in which you don't really understand um, how the space is. And these lamps which are there, which are uh, open in, uh, on, switched on in the night, um, in a way, um, they reveal um, something which uh, is very important somehow linked to the work of, uh, of Leger. So there is this white background, this is structural, black structural lines, and then there are these colors which uh, gives uh, this real aspect to it. And that's the way uh, it looks uh, in the night, and it totally changes the aspect. Take some water. So we show you a couple of uh, like the last two projects. Uh, till now we show we have shown you uh, small scale projects. Uh, we also would like to show you some reflection on a larger scale. And uh, to start, uh, we. We start with this project, which is uh, the result of, a of an invited competition we did back in 2013. 
It's a competition which has been organized by the, by the Milano municipality about the refurbishment, a reconversion of a former velodrome which sits in the, in the, almost in the center of Milano, the central area of Milano, which has been extremely important for the history of bike. Of, uh, it was, uh, as you see, extremely populated. Um, the problem of it uh, was uh, the, um, the weather. I mean, because of the weather, this wooden track Without, which has no roof on top, um, decayed. And at the same time, this uh, uh, wooden track, which was uh, supposed to be measured 400 meters, was actually, with the new rules, uh, the new measure was 397.7 meters. It means that uh, it was not officially official anymore. So no more interest to do competition there. The structure decayed, uh, and uh, I mean, all this important, uh, uh, this important hurt of Milano, because it's still in the memory of the city, completely fell uh, forgotten, until the moment in which the municipality wanted to refurbish it. It's also important, uh, it's a, an important venue because uh, it was uh, the venue of the big concerts in Milano, the important one. So the Beatles played there, and after the Beatles, the last concert was the one of uh, Elad Zeppelin, so Led Zeppelin, in, uh, in Italian somehow, but uh, it was a, a great disaster because uh, somebody had the idea of uh, add to, to them a list of Italian heroes like uh, Lucio Dalla and all these guys you see on the smaller lines, the, the new trolls, the rich and the poor, this kind of, this, this kind of uh, other, they were important, they were important, but at the same time the fun of Led Zeppelin, they didn't like this idea at all, so what happened, it was a uh, a riot. So, and, uh, and this poor guy, Morandi, had to, to, to escape this situation because he started to sing and the, the riot began. So no more concert, and also for that reason, this place was, uh, I mean, the bad, this is the last bad memory of the place. And this is the actual condition. Actually, Competition, we didn't win. Uh, competition uh, was won by somebody else, of course, but the, nothing has been done on the, on the site till now. So this is the actual condition. So a forgotten place, used sometimes to uh, play uh, rugby, uh, American football, not rugby, inside. So the, the team of American football of Milano plays inside. Um, and then you have this big, huge uh, uh, public uh, area, forgotten, uh, kind of a parking area in front. Um, I have a pointer also, which is there. A, a school with no gym is important to detail. Supermarket and some, and here on the lower part, there is a big new development in the area of the ex uh, uh, fair of Milano with three huge towers by Liebeskind, Adid, and uh, Isozaki, and a big park. So this uh, somehow is the head is the, somehow the mineral head of that uh, big intervention. And, uh, yeah. So, of course, the municipality of Milano did not know what to do in the place. So part of the exhibition, uh, uh, sorry, competition brief was also the invention of the brief, of the program. And we proposed for that a public space, first of all, uh, second, uh, a public space dedicated to sports on wheel. So somehow a public space which could uh, uh, keep the memory of the place, um, but uh, opening this space again as a public space. So imagine a stadium, an arena closed off to reopen it to the city. So somehow our task was to invent a sort of new kind of public space uh, which could work at different scale. So at the scale of the neighborhood, and also at the scale uh, of the city and the metropolitan area of Milano. So this was the first proposal of uh, the competition, is the proposal with which we have been invited. And so we just gave this uh, image, which is an image taken from a model, which somehow already contains all the elements of the project. So on the right, you see the stadium. What we did uh, is a, a set of actions. So we removed uh, the, the walls among the structure, so we opened up completely the stadium to the city. Uh, so we kept the naked structure. We connect like this the inside and, and the outside. 
we extended the, the small roof on top of the, of the seats of the stadium toward the outside, covering the, covering the uh, public space outside. And somehow we connected all the uh, cycle path of the city, which were still uh, on a project state, to uh, somehow the tracks we designed inside this public space. So, sorry, okay. So you see here the intervention, again here, the same school which is, Hello. sorry, the same school which is now connected. Uh, this is the, the inside of the, of the stadium with the tracks we designed. And as you see, I mean, the, the three, sorry, here, the three towers here are the development I was talking to you about. And all these red lines are the official bike tracks of the municipality of Milano, which we connected with a, a series of other tracks we designed. So somehow official tracks um, becomes uh, playful paths in this case. At the same time, inside this stadium, there is still the possibility to do official sports. This is our idea. And this is a bit light. You see all the roof that covers the area. This is a, a zoom. Oh, wait. This is a zoom where you see what, what kind of activities we envisage. So apart from the skate park, the playground, the school, for a, a kind of a school of a circulation, you say, like a kind of a police school for the, for the kids uh, to learn how to, how, to, how to bike on the street of Milano, very dangerous street of Milano, and inside all the tracks, and uh, also the, an infrastructural area of the roof, which could uh, serve as support for uh, small concerts, for example. And here are the fields close by the school. So the school, somehow, uh, the idea was also that the school could uh, uh, get a new gym, a very big one, for the sports. This is a zoom on the market area, also with the, yeah, there was a big project of uh, diverting the traffic from that street to another street. We did with some mobility engineers in order to connect really the public spaces. The concert I was talking to you about, there, while there is a bike pole of match in the middle of the of the, of the stadium, and here again the playground. So this is the plan of the project. Of course, we liberated all the uh, curved part, so this becomes, this becomes a completely accessible. And uh, uh, on the straight part, under the seats, we have, we have foreseen uh, on this side the, a gym which actually is already there. There is a very nice gym, abandoned one. Uh, we provided uh, uh, changing rooms for the schools and for the city, so people who want to come there and have sports and start to run, they could use this area. Uh, um, a, a little hostel, a bike repairing shop, and a cafe. So this is somehow the social uh, mix of activities that we have foreseen for the project. This is the last uh, uh, presentation model we did, maybe a scale one to 50, which shows the space outside this big uh, roof which extends toward the outside, and also the permeability with the inside of the, of the project. And this is uh, um, the inside, with uh, the tracks I've talked to you about before, so the, some official tracks and some non-official tracks that becomes kind of playful paths, but also this red thread here is a, a running track, I mean, is a way to access a running track, a panoramic running track on the top, which runs on the top ring of the, of the stadium. And this is the wrong title for the project <laughs> to come. So this is the last project. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's not the Vigorelli Milano, it's a project, um, we, an ongoing project uh, we are working on in uh, Albania. It's more a project uh, which starts from a territorial vision, but then the result, it's a series of uh, small interventions. So the, the bigger scale starts here, so, um, oh, no, sorry, I did this wrong. <laughs> Tirana, Dures, 
and then the road which connect the two. Um, the road, and so the, the road which connects the two is uh, called Durana, which is a kind of never-ending construction of uh, informal housing and um, illegal uh, buildings. So if we go on here, uh, that's the first uh, um, stretch of road, um, which starts from Tirana. So that's, that was the piece in which we, um, that we were in charge to work on. So maybe what, it, what I didn't see before, I'd say before is that the fact that what you see here is also a punctuation of uh, lakes, uh, which um, were not um, natural lakes, but artificial lakes, which were done um, as a production reservoir, agricultural reservoir for the, um, yeah, during the regime, the communist regime. So here is the stretch of land we have worked on. It's, there is this road. Um, the road is uh, completely built with the commercial uh, buildings. Um, and the, this road, that was the question which was asked in the competition, completely cut the area. So in a way, there is no communication uh, between the, the north and the south area of this land, uh, even though they somehow they're part of the same uh, uh, environment. So voila, this is the road. And uh, on one side, these hills. On the other side, these uh, um, commercial buildings. Uh, and on the very end, these uh, mountains. So in a way, the whole project lays on a big valley. And this big valley um, has several infrastructures which connect, which runs through. So this big road, which was the main issue, the um, abandoned um, rail track, some rivers, and then a punctuation of these lakes. So the project was, um, in a way, not to build bridges, as somehow we were probably asked, but to think of how to change the, the use of the landscape or the way the people would use the landscape through a series of uh, section studies, which you see here. So the, there is section uh, one, two, three. Oh, what the, oh. Yeah, it's the old way we call sections, but uh, it's okay. Okay, I don't remember what they're called. Oh, but, so, um, so the sections which would go from the river to the lake each time, and they would cross all these other infrastructures. Then we've, um, this were, was not supposed to be a total project, this section, but it was supposed to be a study section in which, through a series of um, punctual interventions, we, we would try to change the way the, the inhabitants use this space. And uh, so, uh, and then we f we made some focus studies. So two of them being on the road, on the main road, F1 and F2, and then the the third one being on one of those lakes. And uh, uh, and what you see here in red are the possible interventions. So you see it's a constellation of interventions on a rather small scale, which then would allow this. Um, landscape to, yeah, somehow to be connected just by these small interventions, which are rather small public scale, maybe sometimes just add a bench, sometimes add a, a series of lamps, sometimes a pavilion, but always starting from what is already there. So then we focus on this, uh, in a way the project went on, but uh, we focused mainly on the area around this lake, the uh, Kashar Lake, uh, which is also one of these uh, water reservoirs, to turn it into, from tr productional lake to a leisure one. Uh, so the project was, yeah, to redefine a light path around the lake and through a series of small pieces, uh, like a beach, a platform, um, and uh, a diving platform 
to how to, to change the use of this place. Voilà. Thanks. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for a great lecture, and it's wonderful to see the work. Um, I wanted to, I just, I have a few questions, I think, and then we can open it up um, to the audience, but um, maybe just to talk a little bit about, um, maybe picking up, we had a conversation earlier today, but just a little bit about the way that you're working, um, maybe how you've established your office in Milan and now um, in Brussels, but also with working in in different places, sure. um, we, we spoke a little bit about this, but I think how you how you start to work and your approach in dealing with sites that um, between the offices and and the locations, and I thought that was very interesting what you were saying earlier today, in um, how you're able to kind of work between places and feeling you know part of the scene in Milan, but maybe not originally being from there and. I think that's important for the context of the students who are coming from all over the world and yep. approaching new places. Yeah, as, as, we, as, as we said, maybe you can also add the things, Ambra, while uh, among the information I give. But uh, I mean, the office is pretty young in the sense that it started in 2013. We were working, actually the way we met uh, together because we were uh, somehow hazardously coupled in a, in a studio as assistant. Mm -hmm. So we started to work together mm -hmm. in a place, which is Mendrisio, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, we started to work there together as assistant. And uh, actually in a place where Ambra already also studied. I, was, uh, I studied in Venice. This also makes that uh, our somehow education mm -hmm. and the way we were th looking at projects at problem, uh, urban problems were completely different. And this is also what we appreciated uh, at the very beginning, and also now, of course. Of course, we're now we, we might have aligned a little bit more <laughs> our ideas, and like at the beginning was uh, not exactly like that. But it's what we found productive. And uh, somehow that was our first step. Uh, at that time, uh, I was living in Milano already. You were already also living in Milano uh, since a few years, not a lot, mm. and uh, so the most easy thing that we thought was to establish our office in Milano. Mm -hmm. And uh, Milano for us, I mean for me at least, I think for us is not uh, our native city, I mean it's a foreign, it's, it's somehow a new, it was a new context for us, mm -hmm. and we are still discovering this context because uh, it's one of the city in which uh, the real uh, inhabitant of Milano, it will never allow you to be a real inhabitant of Milano. Somehow it's kind of uh, quite conservative, this part. And so the real architects of Milano are also the ones that have studied at the Politecnico. They have this kind of ed education, mm -hmm. which is quite specific. And we are, co we are really collaborating with them in, the, uh, in, ma in many competitions. And also we are, we are, we are uh, somehow um, starting to understand uh, how it works. So, I mean, Milano is not our context. I mean, I studied in Venice, Amber studied in Mendrisio, she's from Roma. Mm -hmm. So, somehow already, like in the beginning of, the, of our story, we already touched many, many cities. Mm -hmm. At the time, no, uh, at the time of today, I would say, uh, Amber lives in Brussels. So, the office that had uh, still has uh, maybe a kind of a Milanese, uh, Mm -hmm. connotation, but not a real, real Milanese, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like an imported Milanese connotation, now has opened up to another city, which is Brussels. Mm -hmm. uh, then we both teach together in Paris. So this European condition right. somehow uh, allows us to move quite a lot. Right. Which also means that the projects, in a way, yeah, we have worked on a few projects in Milan, yeah. but at the end the projects are really from everywhere. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
we are not really, yeah, the architects of a certain mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, because I was going to ask also, what, you know, to what degree would you say your work is indebted to a kind of Italian design scene or sort of Italian mm -hmm. sort of history? I mean, you begin the lecture with a reference, so it's us, an yeah. image. But even in the Chicago um, project, that there's a reference to the do, new domestic landscape, yeah. Embas, which you, mm -hmm. you don't mention, but yeah. I'm curious about you know, where do you situate the work in yeah. relation to that? Yeah, but we are somehow, um, of course, I mean, uh, we are Italian. Yeah. We have our office in Milano. And we are also fascinated, and this is not the main, re the main reason, but we are fascinated by, um, I would say, a specific moment of uh, Milanese, Italian architecture and design, which is the moment in which, I, I mean, I was showing you before the Valentina, uh, the Valentina typewriter, but also the Sotsas project for this banal office, uh, uh, I would say, um, cupboard, somehow, no? folder, and uh, classifier, maybe it's called that, uh, exactly that, uh, that, f that furniture piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and that moment, um, I think that was a, there was on one side an economical question, mm -hmm. so Italy was somehow the economy was pretty well, mm -hmm. so there was a, the amount of architects was not so was less mm -hmm. big than what we have today. Mm -hmm. There was work, there was uh, energy, mm -hmm. there was company. They were uh, we we would call them today enlightened, you know? mm -hmm. so that were mm -hmm. eager to have uh, architects mm -hmm. working for them, like developing products, developing objects, mm -hmm. and so on. And I say architects because there were no. I mean, yeah, there was, but the, the, there were no dis disciplinary um, distinctions, distinction yeah. that we have today. Right. And uh, all these guys, as I, as, I, as I said before, they were all, uh, they all had an architectural uh, mm. education with them, and then is their life, their personal experience that brought Bob Norda mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. uh, graphic design, uh, Vignelli too, mm -hmm. or, uh, I mean, Albini stayed, uh, he, he was always an architect, mm -hmm. but also people like uh, Saul Steinberg, for example. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. he was architect. I mean, he studied. Uh, he, did, he's, he took his diploma in Milano in the Polytechnico, and uh, he, so he's also architect. I mean, this kind of uh, pre-world, let's call, it, in which uh, there was this architectural education that allowed you to do all these mm -hmm. kind of jobs, mm -hmm. while now you have to study interior design, graphic design. Mm -hmm. We we are heading towards a this society that mm -hmm. with our project and also our attitude towards mm -hmm. like, uh, yes, we can do mm -hmm. a small objects, we can do a pavilion, mm -hmm. we aim, we want to do the stadium. Mm -hmm. for, for us, there is no difference. Right. I mean, we don't, we don't feel that we need a designer mm -hmm. to make this stool or we need, a, I don't know, a planner to do the, a mass, a, a urban planner to do the, the stadium. Right. We like to somehow tackle all this, things, the scales, these objects, as they are the same thing, as they were the same thing, mm -hmm. sorry. But also if you take examples like Branzi or Super Studio or Angola uh, Pietro, all these people were always working on different scales and that was uh, pretty normal. Yeah. Yeah. How, do you, how do you, let's say, think about then, um, or define maybe the relationship between architecture and furniture? Yeah. Sort of furthering. How do, you, how do you make a distinction between those things? Because I, I could see mm. some things in the, maybe in the representation of it, and um, which I think somewhat translates into the, the built work, but I'm, I'm curious to mm. hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. You, you want Amber to? I don't know, I mean, <laughs> in a way it's, yeah, the, we do, we do, Small architectures, we do furnitures, but it's always about how to build the narration behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you talk about the small stools, they were tiny pieces of, uh, mm -hmm. of stone, but they were also mm -hmm. for us uh, uh, architecture mm -hmm. or models of architecture mm -hmm. or the, um, the metro line uh, furnitures were uh, starting from an infrastructural project mm -hmm. or the park design pavilion. Mm -hmm. It was 
uh, almost inexistent room with a series of furnitures mm -hmm. around it. You always try to challenge different uh, uh, weights, right. but we, we try always to, uh, not always, but all, the most of the time to make these uh, different layers mm -hmm. of reading and of scale to coincide or to so, so over, Lap. overlap. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's clear. I mean, I think there's also something about the architecture that tends to be, at least in, in what you've shown here so far, um, a kind of treatment of the architecture to some degree as a sort of white background that then you play with whether or not that remains a kind of real through the, the image, like the photograph of the uh, pavilion where it, you say it becomes more of a cutout, right? It yeah. almost erases itself in some ways or, and then the furniture, you know, contrasted with the furniture that mm. is brightly colored or very material. I mean, I think for me, maybe that would be my last question, is just about the relationship between color and material, that it, color is very material, it seems, yeah. um, in a way. I don't know, may, maybe to also, as a contrast with, let's say, maybe the work that was done in, when you were at Peter Zumthor's office, that, that color and material are so, you can't think of one without the other, perhaps, through his work, and um, I think you're, you know, you're doing something different, of course, but how, how do you think about, about that a little bit? <clears throat> so, for instance, in the, yeah, even there, it, mm -hmm. it really, each, each time it's something else. Sometimes yeah. the colors are more um, a way, almost like how to translate the drawing into reality. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the case of the pavilions, it was, an exercise on how to make it the most uh, abstract as possible, mm -hmm. and even the frames around the panels, mm -hmm. how to make readable the drawing mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. of the project. Mm -hmm. So it was really about, yeah, making a, a drawing uh, physical. Yeah. And um, <coughs> in the case of the metro, it was yeah, it was obviously. Mm -hmm starting from the qual inherent quality of the materials mm -hmm. and how to make uh, something new out of it. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay. Anyone, any questions from the audience? Um, if we have a microphone, actually. Any questions? I'm sure there's some. <laughs> <coughs> Everyone had too long of a spring break. <laughs> Good. There we go. Hey, you have a question? So, um, hey, this is working. Cool. Hey, um, so when you guys do like the urban design project, like the one of, for, for the school, the gym, did you guys do like a community outreach or something? Or like y'all like, um, uh, wait, how do you say this? Um, sorry, I'm asking the question without thinking about it. Um, um, or was that part of the program? Was that part of the program, or you no. like did community? No, no. I mean, the, the, in that, uh, uh, like uh, that exhibi that exhibition, this competition mm -hmm. had no brief. I mean, the brief was the building and uh, the fact that we had to do something in the building. Mm -hmm. the, the municipality did not know what, so we had to work also with somebody, um, like pr programmers somehow, people who who are uh, able to program uh, activities to understand how these some activities could be sustainable because of course you can have a lot of good ideas but then there is also an economical factor behind so this if we do something like this it should be some economical economically sustainable but uh, the all brief the idea to open it into a public space uh, the idea of uh, putting an hostel there to connect it with the park on the south, with the school on the west. I mean, all these things we did because we were extremely convinced that uh, we needed not to, in that, in that case, not to build uh, um, a sort of uh, uh, object separated from the city, but really to, to weave all this connection through the building and make it part of the city. So to 
somehow create a sort of fluidity among the outside public space and this enclosed one. So uh, as soon as you enter this arena, you are in a completely different space, but still a public space, but of a different kind. So we invented it. We didn't win. <laughs> another project, but uh, another project which, I, I, what I can say, I mean, it was a bit bizarre on a, if uh, you think uh, um, somehow from the American perspective, I would say, because that project kept the American football activity, but uh, it completely cut the, the space behind the, how you call it, you don't call it goal, you call it when you put the, the ball uh, on the other side of the line. No? So I immediately imagine all these uh, players running to, to reach and immediately finding a, a wall of a glass glazed window uh, of a shopping center to bump. So I imagine the activity would have been like inside the shopping, uh, the shopping mall to look at these huge guys bumping uh, on, the, on the screen, on, on, the, on the glass screen. So, I mean, it, it was not a very... Visionary. Visionary, because it was, they, it transformed this, uh, this uh, project, this uh, velodrome into a mall. It kept uh, some sport activity like the American football one. At the same time, uh, yeah, it was a, it, it would have destroyed uh, really the, the idea of that space. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they didn't do it because, uh, I mean, this is also uh, like part of the somehow Italian context. Uh, they didn't actually check with the historical preservation office mm -hmm. if it was possible to transform that building or not. It turned out it was not possible. It was protected. So, I mean, they, 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 they organized this whole competition uh, inviting people from outside, paying them because it was uh, the people who were invited to to, to do this were, were paid, was paid, and then uh, you discover you cannot build the project. So, in this case, luckily, but because the project, the winning project, was not super good. But mm -hmm. yeah, Kirsten, we have a question. Kirsten, wait for the mic. <laughs> Um, I was hesitant if I had to ask a question, but then I thought maybe why not. Um, no, well, I was wondering to what extent uh, you see your own work as, it has been mentioned somehow, as a continuation of, or at least as the ultimate consequence of the Florentine radicals. It's to say that after declaring architecture impossible, after spending some time in Milan, you seem to propose an architectural practice without architecture. Uh, it's, the, it's the city or it's the landscape and it's, um, well, urban furniture and furniture. Everything else is taken away. Um, even the house up to a point, um, it's, well, it was called neutral or whatever you call it. It's at most an envelope. Uh, the furniture has to do the job. So is what we see is this a statement of intent, you think? Or is it merely, I would say, the result of, I mean, a selection of the day? So, so in other words, are you gradually working towards uh, an architectural practice without architecture? No, I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> personally, it would, it would not be so uh, uh, convenient, uh, eco <laughs> <laughs> economically convenient. No, but, but this I'm not sure. In yeah. fact, I think you probably earn better money with furniture than with architecture, but that's a whole other debate. Yeah? No, it's difficult to... No, but I mean, yeah. no, for, for me, yeah. it's like you guys, I mean, okay, I know you well, I mean, uh, as you know very well. <laughs> Um, I have the feeling that you take a radically different track as, I would say, us or, or Bauku or, let's say, uh, or Dogma or the people, I would say, just before you, in a sense. I mean, I think our um, d desperation with the situation was to do as much as architecture as we could, huh? mm -hmm. uh, to the point, of course, that it ends up very often in extremely, uh, I would say, abstract paper-like projects, but okay, still trying. Um, 
and you, with a few years difference, uh, you revitalize, I would say, uh, Branzi's hothouse argument, uh, which he, he wrote in that book. And you'd say, well, perhaps we end up in architecture at a certain point, but, but that we can do later. I mean, we, we don't need to hurry. And in many ways, I find it, um, I don't know, it, it seems a bit of a more um, yeah, positive or so approach. I mean, you know, it's like um, the confrontation is elsewhere. But then again, it's interpretation, I don't know. I, I like to see, I like to hear this in interpretation because uh, there are also many things you do without the conscience, a certain conscience of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, consciousness. Hmm? Consciousness. Uh, of, uh, of doing. So, yes, maybe we are allowed to do things you were not extremely, you were not allowed to do at a certain moment. It's, you mm -hmm. said the you, Dogma, Bauku project come out of a desperation of a certain moment. And so you needed abstraction in order to, in order to, to exist also. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the contrary, maybe we need less abstraction in order to exist nowadays. Yeah, well, I think, I think so. In, in, a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think it's more alive for what you guys are doing in many ways. It's more alive. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Uh, it's nice that as a, as a, <laughs> a compliment. <laughs> I mean, I mean um, <coughs> no, it's true. I mean, there is a also how to say. I think that uh, in a certain moment, like a few years ago, I think there was a. Um, sort of uh, fear of uh, like a postmodern fear somehow I think that also provoked a series of projects like dogma project and so on I, th I think this bit is sold now like the, you don't risk to do a project like I don't know the furniture pieces of, uh, of uh, Chicago to be labeled as a uh, was more than at the end, I think. But uh, it's my opinion, I would say. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I you also have to say something. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, I think I want to answer for them in some ways, but it's not my place necessarily. But I, I think the I, I agree with the, the the alive or vitality. Mm. I mean, I think what you're suggesting. Um, is true. I think the um, it's interesting though. But the extension of the um, how much the work is indebted to others and or not, and um, you know maybe redefining or taking parts of things and and rethinking it um, because I think there is much more of a focus in your work mm -hmm. that maybe is not so much from from the past, but your own internal working. Mm -hmm. I think and. Um, and it's pretty clear in looking at the images that you've presented that even from the velodrome competition, which you say is from five years ago, you can see all of the elements that you're still working on today, right? So for me, that's a very clear, um, I, I don't know, I would go so far as to say a kind of singular focus, but it um, you know, suggests a body of work, right? And an intention and actually something quite conscious in a way, even if um, maybe it doesn't, it feel like that as much, or um, maybe it's not um, important to claim that at the moment. But to me, I think that establishment of a body of work or so early <laughs> in a practice um, is, is quite remarkable, I think, in that context. So yeah, anyway, I don't know. But, uh, any other? Yeah, there's, we have a couple now. Yeah. Okay, now we're, now we're going. They're coming now, yeah. the question. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was wondering if you can comment on your relationship with the use of references and you know, the continuum of architecture across history and how we fit into it. I feel like we're quite fearful of using references sometimes and you guys seem to just so seamlessly do it. Does that question make sense? <laughs> Yeah, the relation with references, you mean? The relationship yeah, I, I, with I, I, references I lost across, a couple of words. Oh, because across yeah. history, the yeah. relationship with references and where, how you use them to fit into 
kind of the history of architecture somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say maybe I can uh, I can uh, answer through the to the project through the project of uh, of the furniture pieces of uh, like uh, they were actually part of the make new history um, exhibition of uh, of Chicago and uh, for us I mean uh, it was quite clear I mean. It's a difficult question. I mean, this make new history question. Huh? I mean, your question, but also the question of the Biennale. I mean, it can turn uh, in really into, yeah, uh, I would say, it was not, uh, let's say, a light question for a Biennale, I would say. You know? and, and our, our, um, interpretation, which came also, I don't know, maybe the, the lightness with which we took this project is also because we had this project somehow in mind and uh, it's something we wanted to do already and this became, uh, I mean, somehow the project doesn't uh, spring from uh, the question, but it already answered maybe the question. You know? So, but uh, we didn't have to, to sit at the table and to think, okay, this is the question, now we have to make a project which answered this question, and how we do this. It's something that was already there around, and uh, somehow there was this coincidence. And for us, in, in, in that case, I mean, the reference is somehow um, a sort of, uh, is connected to a sort of passion, and I would say love for the city where we used to live, uh, somehow both of us, but also the passion for certain uh, architectural project like the, that one and uh, for us it was natural to take part of this and to transform it to something completely different in a different context so I mean it's clear that uh, this uh, I mean when you see this set of objects together they are the Metropolitan of Milano I mean it's clear I mean you see the lamp you see the, the stained concrete you if you are from Milano you understand what it is if you are not from Milano, like a lot of people were passing by at the Biennial, I mean, through the, uh, through the help of this picture, they could really immediately start to understand the connection of the thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a sort of a direct transformation into something else. But also, if I can add something, yeah. um, it also wants to bring back a certain reflection about contemporary time in a, in a way how at a certain moment in time there was this big um, yeah, uh, energy and production uh, and the uh, things were done ex exactly for that. For, there was a huge energy to build mm. the, the metro line and new materials were, were tested and uh, while nowadays um, we, yeah, basically an architect choose something out of the catalog and, uh, and that we found it very interesting that we would bring this reflection just by comparing this, these two moments, no? By also showing these uh, materials which are so specific and uh, that they're being invented for this metro, then we wanted to say, look what has been done at a certain moment and uh, look where we are now. Without necessarily being a too critical, but also just to bring a reflection out of it. I think we have one here in the middle. <coughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. I just had this um, question in mind, like what, um, because you, you still teach or part of you still teach? Yeah. And I wanted to ask like just what do you learn from teaching basically, or what do you get from the work from your students basically for, for your own practice? It's a space of uh, yeah. experimentation, like I think for yeah. everybody, yeah. We, every teacher. Yeah. We somehow we, we uh, met through teaching, so we start to exchange our ideas to have our contra first contrast, having uh, c making the critics of project of student, having the first ideas. The, we decided to participate to the first competition because we were in the same uh, uh, learning uh, teaching environment and uh, we found this very productive and we kept this 
uh, through the years. I mean, we started uh, to get teaching together, then we separated somehow, also for like, uh, job opportunities and so on. But uh, and we are now teaching together again. And uh, of course, it's uh, the space you, you dedicate to teaching is a uh, hundred uh, percent part uh, of, uh, I would say, the production of the office, not because you use <laughs> Uh, studios to produce your project, of course, but uh, it's because it continuously refresh, renew uh, your knowledge. And the debate among us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a way, we, we met each other by debating on, uh, on architecture through teaching, and uh, that's uh, the way we can keep in talking about it, not in a practical terms as, you know, in uh, the real projects we, we do, but or more on a wider term. But these uh, historical references from the 70s and 80s in Italy, they play a big role in, in, in the way how you teach or, or not so much? I would so say much? not really, no. They were interested in that, but uh, it's not what we are teaching at the moment. You never know. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Some of your projects involved conversion of uh, legs into other uses, like a kasha leg. What other uses did you intend in your projects? In the lake of Kashar. Huh? Uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking if there are other projects with lake, but uh, if we, I mean, the, that specific project we did, uh, which is still not realized, somehow it's on hold, uh, and we hope that uh, the uh, city of Tirana soon will arrive uh, really to the edge of the metropolitan area, and the, their interest will touch also mm -hmm. our project, which is there waiting. Um, so, the, um, I mean, mainly, as Ambra was saying before, like Albania was a communist reg regime. Till uh, nine, like 89, of course, played a role, like I think till the 90s, like early, early 90s. Um, as uh, many communist regime, it was a, a sort of a hydraulic empire. So the state, the planning of the state was total. So and specifically in Albania, which was one of the most, uh, it was somehow the North Korea of, uh, of Europe. Um, Nobody knew what was going on uh, in Albania. And the state were deciding at the time uh, if you would have been a farmer, if you would have been an engineer and so on. And if you would have been a farmer, they would have decided where you had to work in a specific place. I mean, there is no possibility to move. You know? So all the, somehow, the balance among uh, city and countryside was fixed by the state. There was no possibility to, to to go out of the, their boundaries. And uh, the, all the agriculture was organized to feed the country because uh, little by little, they cut all the economical relation with the other communist countries. They were arguing with uh, China, with uh, Russia, Yugoslavia, of course. Mm -hmm. And so they stayed, uh, they were alone. So they had to produce everything they had in the, in the um, they had what they had to eat at the end. So, the lakes were extremely important because they provided all the water for agriculture. And uh, this, uh, uh, after 89, so the 90s, all this hydraulic net, network was uh, destroyed because everybody started to build their houses on the agricultural land. Like the first act of rebellion was to go from the countryside, from the mountains, to go to Tirana and to build a house in Tirana because the, that was the city of opportunities. So it means that they needed space they needed plots, everybody occupied some agricultural plots, and all this network of hydra hydraulic net networks was cut. Um, so our project, I mean, does not foresee to rebuild all this hydraulic network because it's impossible. I mean, the current urban development uh, uh, is not, does not allow to do that, but we want to restore little pieces. And for example, for the, for the lake, our idea was indeed to transform this uh, lake, which was once upon a time working for agriculture, still a little bit it does, but not so much, but still drains the water from the 
from the sides of the hills, so the, the water drains into this big basin. And we wanted to transform this urban slash agricultural uh, abandoned landscape into a park, a park which is an agricultural park, but also a leisure park with a very delicate, uh, delicate uh, act. So tracing the path around the, uh, the park, reinforce it with some uh, key objects. So some of them are big objects, like the diving platform, the beach, uh, the floating platform, and so on. Some of them are very small objects, so the system of bench, what you use for urban uh, design, so a system of bench, uh, the dustbin, uh, all this kind of stuff. So bigger and smaller objects. So we felt uh, that in the memory of the place also, I mean, this lake are extremely important, even if is a memory that has been rejected as a bad memory because it was part of the regime. At the same time, we wanted to turn that into a positive aspect. So to revitalize this lake idea, this lake are amazing. The landscape around this lake is something really beautiful. I mean, we spent a lot of time there at the lake. Yeah. Yeah. Great. One last question. Anyone? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.